Hello, my friends. Today is August 12th. My name is Joseph, and this is Markets Weekly. This week, we're going to talk about three things. First, we're going to talk about how the Fed is slowly laying down the background work for rate cuts next year and why they don't think of that as easing monetary policy. Secondly, we have to talk about the big labor movements we see sweeping across industries in the U.S., and what that means for wage growth and inflation going forward. And lastly, I'm going to do a little bit of myth busting on some of the common doomer takes that I see floating around social media. Okay, beginning with the Fed. So this past week, we had President of the New York Fed, John Williams, give an interview with the New York Times. John Williams is one of the top three people at the Fed, so we always got to listen to what he's saying. The interview was wide ranging, but what stood out to me is how John Williams is trying to explain to the reporter how it might make sense for the Fed to cut rates later next year. Now, the Fed looks at interest rates through the lens of real interest rates. That means nominal interest rates minus inflation. For example, let's suppose that today interest rates are at 5%. Is that high or is that low? Well, it depends on a few things, right? Let's say that you have to, you take out a loan and you have to pay 5% interest on it. But at the same time, let's say that your wages are increasing 10% uh, a year because inflation is high. Well, in that case, if your wages are going up 10% a year, then, you know, maybe 5% interest rates don't sound all that bad. Now, with that in mind, let's think about what happened over the past two years. Inflation on at an annual basis went as high as 9%, and the Fed took interest rates from 0 to 5%. Now, gradually, inflation has been moderating. It's been coming down. And most recently, it looks like it's about an annual rate of about 4%. So as inflation has slowly come down, it makes sense for the Fed to also gradually reduce interest rates a bit, just so the real interest rate it doesn't change too much. Otherwise, if the Fed doesn't cut rates and inflation steadily comes down, what ends up happening is that real interest rates end up increasing. So the Fed effectively is tightening monetary policy even as inflation comes down, and that doesn't really make any sense. Now, this topic is particularly salient because this past week we had another positive CPI print. So this past Week, the CPI print was 0.2% month over month, which if you annualize it, it gets you around to where the Fed's target is. Now, the people who are following the CPI print also point towards the fact, and the San Francisco Fed has a blog post on this, is that according to various measures, a shelter inflation, which is basically, let's say, what you have to pay on rent, is expected to come down further in the coming months, and maybe maybe even head towards deflation. That is to say, rents actually decline year over year. So there's a lot of people who are looking at this and thinking, well, CPI is really good these past two months, and in the future, maybe it will get even better. So uh, you maybe we have to cut rates just to, uh, just to make sure the real rates don't go uh, too high. Now that's one view in the market and not the Fed, and it's a reasonable view. But there are also other views as well. There are people who think that maybe going forward, uh, inflation will continue to either stay sticky or, or maybe even accelerate. After all, if you look at commodity prices like crude oil, it's been rising the past few months. And of course, if you look at wages, well, the latest Atlanta Fed wage tracker, it looks like it's stabilizing about you know four or five percent. It ticked up a tiny bit month over month, but it's still. At increasing at a rate that's not consistent with um, with 2% inflation. So right now, going forward, I think the expectation is that um, the Fed probably has to adjust the rates a little bit next year, maybe cutting a little bit. But that doesn't mean that they're going back to where they were pre-pandemic. Think of it more as um, staying higher for longer does not necessarily mean uh, it's staying going to a maximum level and just keeping it there for a long time. They could adjust it a little bit, let's say to 4.5% and still keep it for a long time. 
We'll have to see what the data shows going forward. Uh, I suspect that it would make sense for the Fed to cut maybe a little bit next year, but definitely not a lot. Okay, now let's take on the next topic. So over the past several months, we've seen big movements in labor across the country. Uh, we had lots of negotiations with the airlines, which ended up with United, for example, giving their pilots big raises. We've also most recently had a big potential strike with UPS, where the UPS workers basically walked away with sizable wage increases. Now, right now, what's front and center is we have ongoing strikes in Hollywood, where the writers and the actors are on strike together. From what I understand, this is not very common. Usually, usually it's one, one, one uh, group of workers striking and then another group of workers striking, but rarely do they strike together and they're, they're striking together right now. And of course, we also have a looming strike with the United Auto Workers, who are the workers who work for the big uh, American auto companies based in Detroit, and they're asking for a lot more money. So what's happening? Why is there all this labor activity? So if you've been following this program, then you know that overall, we are in a very, very big demographic shift. Um, our working force population hasn't really been increasing over the past several years, but at the same time, our economy continues to grow so, and boomers continue to retire. So structurally, we have a labor shortage and that's giving labor a lot of power. We see this in the ongoing wage increases and now we're seeing it more aggressively in ongoing strike activity. There's a really good Odd Lots episode on the United Auto Workers that came out last week. And what the leader of the strike is saying is that, you know, they feel like they have power and this time they're demanding more money. Um, from their perspective, they look at the surging corporate profits over the past few months, that past few years, and corporate profits have indeed absolutely surged post pandemic and they want to get their share of it. And finally, because there is a structural decline or structural labor shortage, they're able to get it. So if you look at this on a, on a broader picture, that suggests that wages really are gonna stay high of, for, for an extended period of time. And I actually think that's a good thing. Now let's zoom out a little bit and look at uh, the macro trends between labor and businesses over the past few decades. And what you'll note is that labor's share of overall income has been steadily declining over the past few decades. Uh, while corporations and let's say high-skilled workers in, in finance and tech have been doing very well, your, your typical blue-collar worker has been doing very poorly. In effect, because of globalization, uh, the unskilled labor in vast, in other parts of the world, say China and India, were basically able to export uh, labor was basically able to be exported uh, globally, or another way of saying it is, of course, that American companies moved their factories to where labor was cheap, but no, same thing. So the total supply of labor increased significantly over the past few decades because of globalization, but we're at a point where all of that is seems to be gradually reversing. Now, the workforce in the US is not growing, but even in China, the workforce is expected to gradually decline uh, because of their one child policy. So they're gonna face a severe, severe decline in their workforce in the coming years, not yet, but in the coming years. So globally, you know, workers are gonna have more power. They're going to be able to have higher wages. So in a sense, you can think of uh, society as becoming a little bit more egalitarian, uh, simply due to basic supply and demand. Now, I think that has pretty big implications for inflation going forward, uh, because as wages increase, well, that means that more people are gonna have more money to spend. And as we all know, uh, if you give rich people a lot of money, they tend to buy assets. So uh, over the past decade, rich people got a lot of money and they went and they bought stocks, they bought real estate, and we all saw all those prices skyrocket. But when you give lower income people more money, they tend to spend it on goods and services, right? So, and we saw that during the pandemic, we gave everyone uh, stimmy checks and they went and spent it on stuff and we had tremendous amounts of inflation. Uh, 
So the big trend going forward, I think, is for labor to have a bigger share of income and they're going to spend that money on goods and services. And I think that's going to keep inflation pretty structural going forward. Um, and I think that's going to be the, the big story of the next decade. Okay, now the last thing I want to talk about is I want to myth bust some of the doomer narratives that I see floating around social media. So now, okay, just, just to level set with everyone and to come clean, from my read of the data, the US economy is doing really well. So we got first quarter GDP, it's growing above trend. We got second quarter GDP, it actually uh, accelerated over the first quarter. And based upon data as, we, as it comes in, and this is really, really preliminary and it's gonna change a lot, uh, this quarter also looks like it's gonna be pretty good. So you combine that with record low unemployment rates and, and rising wages, the US economy seems to be doing really well. And yet, despite all this, and I suspect when this year's over, we're going to we're, we're going to be find that we're living in a pretty good economic conditions. And yet, throughout all this, there's been so many people who are just dooming and glooming and crying at imminent recession and pointing to all sorts of things to try to to try to um, justify that viewpoint. Uh, I'm going to go over just three of them that I think were that stood out to me that were particularly wrong. Okay, so the first is that uh, many times we see people post on social media soaring amounts of US bankruptcies. The narrative, I suppose, is that interest rates have gone higher, corporations just can't handle these interest rates and they're filing for bankruptcy at very high rates and then it's just gonna go be doom and gloom, we're gonna have another crisis, mass layoffs, and so forth. Now, let's take that data set and zoom out a little bit. Now. Uh, this Buffalo, uh, I, don't, I don't know his real name, on Twitter does really good work and he has this good post where he actually went to the official data sources and looked at the quarterly bankruptcy filings in the US for the past decade. And you can see from the chart that he created, yes, there's been a spike with bankruptcy filings. But once you zoom out a little bit, you'll notice that it's a spike from really, really low levels. And bankruptcy filings seem to be you know, basically nothing to uh, nothing to be alarmed about. That that seems to be uh, a very misleading chart of, of uh, you know bankruptcy soaring, and that's in line with what we see. Right, zooming out a little bit, corporate profits are very high. So corporations are hiring people, consumers are spending, and so you, you really wouldn't be expecting tremendous amounts of corporate bankruptcies. Okay, the, the second myth that I would note is that oftentimes this past week, I saw that there was a headline where uh, US consumer credit, uh, credit card debt soared past a trillion dollars. Now, there seems to be many people looking at this and suggesting that, you know, this is really bad because it suggests that maybe the consumers are in dire, in really bad shape. People uh, are trying to make ends meet. They just can't make ends meet, so they're going out to borrow money, maxing out their credit cards, and, and things are really dire. Okay, that's one narrative. There's another narrative you could tell, and the way that I would do this is I would obviously just zoom out a bit. Now, when you zoom out a bit, that trillion dollars in credit card debt doesn't look so, doesn't, doesn't really stand out. What you'll see is that it seems basically to be on trend. So during the pandemic, it seems like people they were making a lot of money. Okay, well, they continued to make money and they got semi checks, but they didn't have any place to spend it since they were locked down. So they basically just paid down their credit card debt. So we see credit card debt decline a lot during the pandemic. And then now that things are normalizing, we see credit card debt climbing back towards trend. So it's around trend, which is, you know, would be about a trillion dollars. Now, then the question is, why are they taking out credit card debt? Is it really that because they can't make ends meet? Well, well that's totally possible. But we, we got to look at this through the totality of the data. And the data shows that unemployment, you know, multi-decade lows, wages increasing, inflation coming down. That is to say that real wages are increasing. And consumer confidence is also ticking up as well. 
So when I look at this credit card data, what it suggests to me is that consumers, they're making money, they're having jobs, they're feeling more secure, and they're just you know borrowing to spend a bit more money, which is totally normal. And I, I don't read any doom and gloom from this at all. Now, the last doomer myth that I like to talk about is that because interest rates are higher, uh, households have, are having to spend tremendous amounts of money on their interest expenses, and that's stressing them. Now, you can look at a chart of personal interest expenses, and you'll see that indeed it's spiked higher over the past few uh, quarters. And that makes total sense, right? The Fed increased interest rates from zero to 5%. So obviously your interest rate expense is gonna go up. Now the question is, is this something to be alarmed of? And I don't think it is. Again, I think it's important to look at the totality of the data. Now in this chart here, we see interest rate ex personal interest rate expenses uh, next to personal wages. Now, what should really stand out to you is how small wages are as a fraction of, of wages. And also note wages have gone up significantly over the past few years, uh, definitely uh, greater than 5% interest. So, okay, and one thing you have to also keep in mind is that for the vast majority of people, uh, their biggest debt is their mortgage payments. And most mortgage holders uh, were able to refinance to take advantage of record low interest rates. And so um, their interest rate expense is probably, for their mortgage expense is probably around 3% and will be for the foreseeable future. So they're basically locked into really low rates even as inflation is relatively high. So interest rate expense has definitely gone up, but when, no, when, you, when you zoom out, you see that it's just not that big a portion of household expenditures, especially since people were able to benefit from low mortgage rates. Now, the people who are buying homes today, some would say, yeah, they have to face 7% mortgage rates, uh, but that's actually not super true either. Uh, because for a lot of people, when they're buying a home today, they don't really have any uh, resale homes to buy because there's not a lot of inventory, so they're going to buy a new construction. And what the builders are doing is that they're buying down their mortgage rates. So for example, usually if you go and buy a new home, a builder will maybe throw in closing costs, maybe give you a few up upgrades and something like that, basically to sweeten the deal. But builder, uh, home builder mar margins have been wide, wider than they were pre-2020. So instead of offering all those closing costs and things like that, they're offering to buy down mortgage rates. So even though what you see on the, on the website is a 7% mortgage rate, what actually many new home buyers are facing is somewhere around let's say five and a half percent. So you gotta keep that in mind as well. So again, I, I don't see this increase in interest rate payments as, uh, as very alarming, especially because as, as I've shown, wages are going much higher uh, than, than that. And at the end of the day, it's, it's not a big part of your household expenditures on the aggregate. Okay, so that's all I've prepared for today. If you like what I'm producing, remember to like and subscribe. And if you're interested in learning more about the financial system and my market views, check out my blog, fedguide.com, and my online courses, centralbanking101.com. Thanks so much, and I'll talk to you guys next week.